Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance and interest to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Welcome to this week's edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. This week's edition is going to be a focus on the State House issue of, related to the cuts to the providers of services to the developmentally disabled. We have two guests this week. Representative David Bennett, thank you for joining us, David. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, David, you are a representative of District 20, which is yes. in the city of Warwick. Uh, you are a psychiatric nurse over at Butler Hospital. Yes, I am. Okay, and we uh, also know that you have uh, an education background. You're a Warwick person, graduated from Tollgate. Tollgate okay. High School. Went to Rhode Island Junior College, CCRI, and Rhode Island College, right? Yes. Yeah, the triumvirate of, uh, of public schools uh, here in Rhode Island. Welcome. Yes. Thank you for Thank you joining much. us. Thank you for having me. Okay, and Emmanuel, Emmanuel Falk. You are the director of our, for Service Employees International Union, SEIU, here in Rhode Island. Thank you for joining us. It's good to be back on Labor Vision, Jim. Okay. Well, why don't we start with just a little bit of background. David, why did you get involved in politics? I know you, you're a, a newly elected rep. You're, you're in your second year now. You were first elected in 2010. What got you involved in politics in the first place? Well, um, watching, watching the way things were going, uh, the economy. Back in 2008, I ran for Senate. And um, the way the, it happened, it's kind of funny. But I was, I was a, a coach politician, and my wife used to say, well, why don't you do something about it? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I did, and she didn't think I'd go this far. But I think we need a representation um, for, for medical representation up there, and more nurses I wish would apply. Um, I, I, I am loyal to Warwick. I'm loyal to Rhode Island. I was born here. You know, um, my father was a teamster. Um, I feel that uh, if we can't move our state forward, then we're going to be in a predicament similar to what we're in right now. Um, when I ran for, for politics, I only saw the light side of the fence. Now I get to see the dark side, too, and it's not always pleasant. I think I've got a few more gray hairs from it. <laughs> um, but I try to represent Warwick, um, and I also the state of Rhode Island, the best I can do. Um, I'm not perfect. I, I have to weigh everything I do because I don't have a law background. I have to make sure um, I make the right decisions. And, you know, I question my own decisions on, on some of my votes. Um, but I, I look at what's good for Warwick, what's good for patients, what's good for hospitals, uh, labor. I mean, you know, we need jobs in the state really bad. That's why I'm glad to see that the airport's moving forward. Um, I have also got a, a, a bill in now to make Pontiac Mills uh, an enterprise zone, which will bring jobs in for construction and painting. Um, but right now, I'm focused on the develop developmentally disabled. Um, I think it's to go after the most vulnerable people in, in Rhode Island and take money from them and present it one way and actually see the results of it. it it's, uh, it's not only annoying, it's depressing. Sure. Now, we appreciate your leadership on that issue. I know, um, having spent a lot of time uh, lobbying for teachers and nurses in the General Assembly, that there are a lot of educators on the Health Education and Welfare Committee in the House, but there's very few health care providers. And I have to imagine your expertise as an RN sitting on that committee um, is really valuable for not only your constituents, but the whole state. Yes. Um, and one, of the, one of the things we were talking about in the Oversight Committee was the admissions into the hospital. Um, if you are a, a non-controlled diabetic, your doctor can grab a hold of this, you know, and get you regulated. Mental illness, our biggest problem in mental illness is non-compliance of the patient, and the patient is going to need admissions to get their meds adjusted. Um, when I brought this up, they were lumping it in with medical, 
You know, and a psychiatric illness is not, you know, the same as a medical illness. It's an illness. But um, if without compliance, you know, you're not going to have good results. The person needs to be into their own treatment. Just same as a diabetic or a heart patient. If they're not taking their meds, exercising, eating the proper diet, unfortunately, with psychiatric patients, they need the medication. And the sicker they get, the more their mind can tell them not to take the medication. You know, so it, my my input is uh, respected. You know, and and I'm glad of that. Um, again. Uh, you know, we, we need representation from the average middle class guy that's working out there. I mean, I work 40 hours a week, plus I go to the General Assembly. Um, I have a family. And that's the value of a, of a part-time legislature, that you don't have people who are professional politicians per se, but they're people who have regular jobs just like everyone else in Rhode Island who bring their expertise uh, into the building. That's a terrific feature of what we have here in Rhode Island. Yes. Emmanuel, um, what got you involved in the labor movement? Well, um, you know, I, my mom was a, a union member. Uh, my father was, a, um, you know, an active, active progressive or, or liberal. Uh, I grew up in Narragansett. Uh, I was afforded a good life through, um, you know, my mom's union job. She was a member of uh, AFT. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Rhode Island Federation of Teachers. Mm -hmm. Both, and, both apply uh, for me. That's fine. Yeah, and I, I think uh, so. I, you know, I, I had a good life down there. And as I got older and uh, started to, you know, go up to Providence more, ultimately going to college, you know, I saw a lot of injustice in the world. You know, on health care, not everyone was covered. Um, you know, income inequality. And uh, initially, out of, out of college, I worked on some political campaigns. I thought that was kind of the, the way to change things, and I, I fundamentally still believe in a way they are. Um, but ultimately, I ended up taking a job with, with SEIU on a healthcare campaign, and um, you know, had a lot of experience with, with healthcare workers, you know, members at Butler and, and women and infants. And uh, I, you know, early on, I said, you know, the labor movement is, is the vehicle to make change. And that's where I want to be. So that's how I got involved. And I, you know, I think historically, um, that's that's been proven. You know, Medicare, Social Security, the weekend, ending child uh, uh, child labor. That was all done by the labor movement and workers. And I think when workers come together, we can we can change the world. And I want to be a part of that. That's terrific. And uh, a lot of that rings true for me, having been a union rep for. 28 years now, starting with SEIU, SEIU so right. I, I, always, I always give a shout out to, to right. the union. So let's talk about the cuts to the developmentally disabled. Last year, Governor Chafee proposed a budget that actually cut money for the developmentally disabled providers, but the General Assembly took that approximately $9.5 million cut and then cut it more. Uh, in a decision made right before the budget passed in June uh, to the tune of a total of $24 million in cuts to the providers. Right. It's created uh, real issues with a lot of the different agencies, uh, real issues with the workers, certainly issues for what kind of services we're providing. Representative, um, what have you heard about uh, that issue at the time it passed last June? Well, when it passed, it was presented to us as um, a bill that, that a uh, bill that would hurt the provide, not hurt the providers, uh, limit the providers from abusing the money. That's why we went to 15 minute increments to follow the money. Um, when they put it into the budget at 24 million, again, we were, we were told that it would affect the providers. Well, I've been out uh, and about, I've been to Trudeau, I, I've been down to um, um, the West Bay Residential, I've been to some forums, and it's still hurting the clients, and it's hurting the worker, the people that take care of these, these clients. Uh, these are hard, dedicated, underrated, underpaid workers. And if we cut that force, then you're cutting the lives of, of the disabled. Um, and they look at it as a punishment. You know, a lot of the de developmentally disabled, um, when they lose the worker that's been with them for a year, two years, taking care of them, and all of a sudden they consolidate, they close the group home, and that person's moved. Um, they don't see that, that the, it was done to help them. 
you know, because really it wasn't. It was done to, to help the system. Um, the workers, uh, if you lay off these workers, it's going to put an overload of work on the people that are remaining. And it's a hard job. This is a very hard job. I mean, you, have, you take care of these people and you have to treat them as you would someone you love. And, you know, and these workers do love their clients. I mean, I've talked to them. They, you know, they'll go out on, on the limb for their clients. They'll, they'll go that extra yard. And, it, you know, and when that person leaves, that client, it, it, it's be like, you know, losing a friend or a family member. You know, the person who takes care of you, possibly, you know, um, somebody as close as a mother. I see the effects it has on parents. Now, these are adults, disabilities, um, developmentally disabilities are adults, but their parents are aging. And they're worried what's going to happen to their children after they pass. And if I was in their situation, I'd be worried myself. And to, to spend their later years after taking care of, of, of their child or children um, all these years and seeing the hard work to put it back on them, you know, they can't pick up a, a full-grown person the way they used to. You know, get up in the middle of the night, make sure they're okay. Um, some of them need group homes, and uh, and they need assistance taking care of the of the their loved ones. And the clients themselves, they're wonderful. They're wonderful people. Um, you can see um, how much they enjoy the contact. And if you get robots in there taking care of these people. They lose the contact. They use the human touch, that look in the eye, that caress, that, that extra time you take feeding them. Um, and it's sad, you know, and like again, I'm dead. they're underpaid. I mean, I know I the, the workers at Trudeau, where, where I represent the workers, the starting mm -hmm. wage is $10.15 an it's hour. It's incredible. And, and, and a majority of my 250 members, that's what they make. Yes. And how do you make a living on that? And, and expect people to stick around year after year. And you want some stability for these clients. These it's people, very important. They, stability is very important. You know, they, and the same as they're, they're, if they're in a group home and they get used to the people they're, they're living with, now they consolidate and three of them go here, two of them go here. It's like breaking up a family. They're, they're together, you know, sometimes eight to, I don't know, 16 hours a day. Some of them are, stay there all the time. Parents come in and take them on when they can. Um, it's a very vulnerable uh, population there. And if we can't take care of these people, what's it say for us? You know, it, it's, it, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish I could put it into words that would, that would communicate it better. But frustration is the best word I can think of. No, I, th I think you know? that's, a, that's a good description, yeah. particularly if you weren't made aware that this $24 million cut was going to have an impact on services, because people weren't aware of that in June, were they? Yeah. Uh, I wasn't. I mean, I can only speak for myself. I'm, I'm sure the, the other reps, we have some progressives up there. We have a lot of freshmen. We have some excellent representatives up there. And um, I can't say enough about the people I work with. Um, but like again, like again, like I said, it, it, we were told it was going to go after the providers, that they were making money charging for an hour when it only took 15 minutes to do something, um, paying transportation. This is why there's 10 bills that I know of going through right now trying to get pushed in, into a law. Um, Maria Samini, Representative Maria Samini um, out of Providence, she, she's got a very good bill in. Um, it, what it does, it brings the, the taxes for anyone who makes 250000 uh, plus back to the original tax that they paid before the big cuts came. Uh, the beauty of it is when the unemployment, correct me if I'm wrong, right. the unemployment, that drops, every point it drops, that tax drops with it. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes sense. I, if you're going to restore money for the developmentally disabled, you have to find it somewhere. And certainly taxing rich people who've gotten breaks, who haven't created jobs in this state in particular, is, is certainly a good way to go.
Right. Uh, Manuel, you were around the State House last year. Was right. there a hearing in the General Assembly on this proposal to cut $24 million? Right. Part, so what, part of the, the thing that makes the, um, the fight that we're engaged in now so appalling is it was my first year up there, so it was kind of a whirlwind, <laughs> whirlwind tour, yes. Um, and uh, there was a hearing on the $9.5 million cut as part of the, uh, the governor's budget. Um, and then at the last moment, as the finance committee presented its final budget, um, like you said, it, it was uh, it grew to twenty-four million dollars, and there was no hearing on it. There was no opportunity for parents, consumers, advocates to weigh in on it. And I think if there had been a hearing, I think it would have been really hard. For, it, it probably would not have gone through because I think it would have been very compelling the argument that was made. So basically, it went through no hearing. No one really knew what it was until two or three days after the House vote. Um, we finally figured it out uh, during the Senate hearing. And then it basically was on the floor, and people really didn't understand what they, they were, were, were voting for. And, um, and you know, folks were told this is not going to hurt direct care. It's not going to hurt um, the consumers. And that has, that's, born, that's proven to be false. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen it. Um, what have, we, what have you seen out there in terms of the impact that these cuts have had on, on the consumers in the past couple of months? Well, specifically to Blackstone Valley Arc, which uh, uh, 1199 SEIU represents, um, they're starting to move towards layoffs. Um, they've done what they call program consolidation. Um, so they're putting different populations, different age groups uh, together so they don't have to um, um, spend as much on, on staffing. Um, that undermines the the, the quality of the program. Um, the, the, uh, they're chipping away at things like um, in the kitchen, for example, they've replaced uh, a functioning kitchen where they made meals for the consumers. Um, they've replaced those with vending machines, um, which uh, has cost consumers that are high functioning enough that are, you know, they get these, these, these jobs a few, few hours a week, they get a little stipend, they feel the dignity of, you know, getting, getting some pay for some for honest day's work. That's been eliminated. So a lot of the of, of the really um, what makes you know that some of the programs special um, are being eroded. Um, there's been layoffs across, you know throughout the state, union, non-union places. At some of the non-union places, you know people that start at, at ten dollars an hour, um, even less, are taking a five percent cut. That is devastating to them, to the consumers, and as the economy gets better, people are not going to stay in this field. Um, if that's where um, the pay is going to be, and it's 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 kind of a it's, it's it's kind of perverse that you know he mentioned the tax cuts for the rich that we continue to balance our budget on 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 you know the working poor people that work at the agencies they they want to work they work hard and um, they they're the ones that are, are paying to balance the budget and there's just something there's something fundamentally wrong when. The people that have the least are called to sacrifice the, the most during a tough economic time, and um, it's it's really a shame. And we're gonna we're gonna keep fighting to try to, um, you know, be the conscience at the state house and, and get them to um, change course. One of the most visible examples of service cuts that I've seen is a couple of different agencies have cut back the day program services, services uh, right. for people who just come in from eight hours a day to six hours a day. And I know uh, Trudeau, where, uh, where my union represents the workers, right. they're planning to do that in the next few weeks. And I just think it's a shame that the state is backing away from providing, you know, a full eight hours of services for, for people, you know, most of whom, you know, live with their families, but just, uh, you know, go, go to Trudeau and other places, you know, to, you know, maybe to work or to, you know, spend some time doing activities and that the state is cutting back on that. And it's just a very visible right. um, way that the state has, has hurt those with developmentally disabled with right. this $24 million I mean, cut. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to talk more about the day program, I mean, that, that reduction in day program it is devastating to the families. They come to rely on that, that eight hour program so that they can go out and work and make, you know, make sure that they know that their, their child's being taken, well, taken care of. Um, it throws people's lives upside down. It makes um, you know, folks that are looking for work or have work harder because they now have to figure out, well, my, my son or daughter is only gonna be taken care of for six hours now. What do I do in those last two hours? Do I, do I miss a shift? Do I have to come home early? 
um, it's 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 really it's 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 really having a devastating effect on, on people that come to, to rely on these services. Sure. And these are people who sacrificed. Not sacrificed. They love their children. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I, I hope that didn't come out the wrong way. Um, they're consumers. They they add to the economy. I mean, even the workers that are taking care of these people right. add to our economy. They do shopping in our local towns. They buy our goods. They keep all these businesses running. The, their parents, their parents have to work, and they, they need downtime too. I mean, you know, and the assistance that gets them, and they're aging. You know, if I could, if my son's 35 to 40 years old, and you know, I'm getting up there, and for me to, it, it depends on the level of care that person needs. But it all affects the economy, they, you know, and like he said, they're taking a 5% pay cut at a job that pays or at $10 an hour, $9 an hour. You can leave that job and deliver pizzas, not nothing against delivery pizza guys. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you're talking about taking care of a human being, and not just one, usually two or three of them, maybe more. I don't know. You Often know? more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you have to do it with it in your heart. You just can't go in and do it for the money. If it was for the money, these people would not be there. You're, you're would, absolutely right about you know, that, that they would move on. And, and that's what's right. being put at risk by this pressure to, to cut wages. I think you mentioned a, a terrific issue related to the economy. I think what most Rhode Islanders don't realize is when you cut state spending for the developmentally disabled, Rhode Island is actually giving up some matching federal dollars as well. That's big. That's you know, This right. is the bills that are going through. Let, let's say my bill, my bill I'm asking. Um, Talk about your bill. Yeah, why don't you describe what it does I'm, first. I'm asking to restore the assisted living a group home money back, a supplemental money back to the individual. Um, we've got, like I said, 10 bills going through. Um, if, we, if we get 10 million, then we get matched by the government. So that's 20 million. You know, E-Man brought this to my, my attention yesterday. So it's, it sense, makes sense for us to restore the money and, and get the federal money to bring us back to where we belong. I mean, if we get 12 million and the, and the federal government gives us 12 million, there's our 24 million. Right. But we cut 24 million just out of ah, what we have. Now we're losing $24 million that would have been matched. I think they will match us 100%, oh, right? Match. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. good, yeah. Yeah. One match, right? You know, so we're losing. Now, you know, we're not getting this money. We're not losing it because we never had it to begin with. You know, we had it when we were investing. But, in, but in that's money that we've taken out of the local Rhode Island economy, so half of which was coming from Washington, D.C. Absolutely. So, you know, and sometimes that's another reason I get into politics. You know, I, I could never understand the thinking. You know, uh, Green Airport in the middle of Warwick, the landfill next to the reservoir. These are things that always puzzle me. This puzzles me even more, you know. Um, the, the money, you know, we, we still provide money to other agencies. Like, like I put a bill in last year that passed and became part of the budget for the uh, uh, medical leave for terminally ill prisoners. Now this is a terminally ill prisoner that can't get out of bed. The doctor has to certify that they are this way. And they, we save money on putting guards with them mm -hmm. while they're in the hospital. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was incorporated into the budget. That is, is, I feel, a sensible cut. But when you cut money, you know, that's gonna hurt the whole system, you know, it, it, then you have to pay more money to recover, and then you can't get the people that were originally doing the job because they moved on. So it's a lose-lose situation. If we restore the money, it's a win-win situation. So where's the logic, you I, know? I think you raise a good point. Um, Emmanuel, you, you talked about being uh, a, a voice of conscience on this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, an, there's groups that are focused on this. I know there was a recent event on Valentine's Day, Representative, mm -hmm. I know you, you were there, um, a Have a Heart event. Could you describe what that was and, and, and let our viewers know who's working to fix this problem? Right, so there's a, there's a growing movement and growing co coalition, um, Have a Heart, and uh, um, they announced uh, they came together on Valentine's Day to try to, you know, bring you know more attention uh, to this this issue, and um, you know it was kind of the theme of you know the General Assembly, you're breaking our hearts. And while it was kind of kitschy, it is it is true. Like this is really um, hurting people, 
And um, the, you know, we've been fighting on this campaign now for almost eight months. And um, it, you know, it's, it's, I've, I've come across a lot of incredible stories. And what really has come through, and especially in that event, is, is the profound love that there is between the consumers and the people that, that work with them every, every day. Um, they, are, they are essentially a part of the family. And you hear that across the board. The fa you know, family members consider the workers part of the extended family. The consumers are friends, family. And um, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, um, it, was really, it was a really powerful event. Um, and you know, families, families spoke. And the whole time I'm thinking, why do we have to do this? Like, we should be taking care of the people that have the least, um, that have the biggest challenges. You know, these, these, you know, when, when, when folks have kids, um, the kids ultimately grow up and, and, and move out. Um, but when you have a, a child with a developmentally disabled, you know, they pretty much stay at home for, through their adult years. And it's, an, it's very challenging. And the state is making their lives more challenging. And it just doesn't make sense. So we really wanted to highlight, you know, Literally, like our the hearts um, are are being broken, and you had a a, a a family member from Trudeau and her daughter speak, and I got a little choked up. Mm -hmm. There there were there were a lot of people, you know, grabbing the, the Kleenexes, and um, this this issue is, is 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 so big, and I think it's really spotlighting something that's fundamentally broken with our with the way we um, conduct public policy in the state right now. Sure. Why don't we take a moment and we can show the viewers a, a clip of the Have a Heart event from this past Valentine's Day, February 14th. Welcome everyone here today, and thank you for joining us at our Have a Heart, Restore the Cuts rally on this wonderful Valentine's Day. And you, all, you all look very festive, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Frank Flynn, and I'm the president of the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and my organization represents the employees and staff at the Trudeau Center in Warwick, and we're proud to be here. Give a shout out to yourself. Woo! And, and we're, we're proud to be here today with our brothers and sisters from the United Nurses and Allied Health Professionals who represent the staff at Seven Hills, as well as the Service Employees International Union who represent the staff at the Blackstone Valley Arc. Um, we're here today to support the 3,800 members of Rhode Island's developmentally disabled community, their families, and the network of people who provide tremendous support for them every day of the year. So give a shout out to all those folks. Um, this is a very personal issue for me. Um, it's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, my family knows first and foremost how trying can be to find an appropriate placement for a sibling with developmental disabilities. Um, through our experiences with my younger brother Chris, uh, who's now 48 years old, we've lived through a progression of services in the state of Rhode Island, beginning with a long-term residence at the Ladd School that many of you are aware of. And I'm proud to say that for the past 20 years he's been placed in a wonderful group home situation and we want to continue to be able to see that my brother and everyone else that's impacted can have an experience like that and that's why we're here today to talk to our politicians tell them to restore the cuts that they've cut so that everyone has that same opportunity. Amen. As I said, my family has truly been fortunate that my brothers had that opportunity to live in a stable and caring environment. 
Uh, through that opportunity, my family has also developed a long-term relationship with many of the staff who escort my brother home at times to family dinners and holiday gatherings, and it's a wonderful opportunity to get to really bond with those people who provide such a valuable service, and we owe them a tremendous debt, and we can't forget them now at their specific time of need. And I can tell you that these cuts are already eliminating many agencies' abilities to, perform, to provide those important services that they do that are very important to uh, clients like my brother and so many others. Uh, not very long ago, Rhode Island was a national model in providing safe, healthy, and supported community-based living environments for our disabled brothers and sisters. In addition to safe homes, they provided numerous work and vocational opportunities, as well as social and recreational opportunities. In essence, they provided a chance for a dignified, productive life for my brother and thousands of other Rhode Island's neediest citizens. We need to get back to that. We can't allow them to continue to make these cuts and whittle away at these services that are so vitally important to all of these clients. Amen. Since 2008, the Rhode Island General Assembly has cut over $37 million from the developmentally disabled budget, including $24 million in this past budget alone. That's unconscionable. These cuts will force the elimination of services, cuts in programs, closure of group, home, group homes and other facilities, and the reduction of wages and benefits to the dedicated caregivers which service them. This will set back the, pro the progress that Rhode Island has made in this area by decades. It's simply unfair and unjust to, to, to target this population. I know that these cuts do not represent the priorities of the state of Rhode Island that I want, and I'm sure they don't represent the priorities of the state of Rhode Island that you want. Our most vulnerable citizens and our most dedicated caregivers need and deserve all of our support. As a society, we cannot let our government cut the benefits to the most needy while keeping tax cuts to the most wealthy. It has to stop. On this Valentine's Day, we have to call on Governor Chafee, your senators and your representatives to have a heart and restore this vital funding and begin the process today. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Tammy Bellers and her daughter Tabitha. And Tabitha is a client of the Trudeau Center, and Tammy is her mom. Hello. Thank you all for being here tonight. We're here to ask the Assembly to please have a heart. I'm Tammy, and this is my daughter, Tabitha. With the millions of dollars cut out of the budget, it's become more difficult to keep these programs open. A program like the one Tabitha goes to every day. One that promotes independent self-worth and being part of the community. My daughter fears that the cuts, if the cuts continue, all the programs will go away. This would be absolutely devastating to her. <laughs> As a support staff, I know if these cuts continue, my hours will be cut, I will have my pay cut, and I may even lose my job. It breaks my heart to think that the people who need us the most and the support staff who want to be there for them are taking such a big hit when those who are the top 1% get all the breaks. And as a mother, I go to bed every night with a heavy heart, thinking, am I going to lose my job? 
Is my daughter going to lose the program that she loves to be part of every day? Or will the assembly members show how big their hearts really are, do the right thing, and restore the funding that they have cut, and no more cuts? We can't take it, right, Tabitha? Yes. Do you like to go to work every day? Yes, I am. Do you like to earn a paycheck every day? Yes. All right. Tell them. No more cuts. No more cuts. Let's talk about the everybody's Get here. Very good. Thank you. All right, Jessica. Thank you, Tabitha and Tammy. Thank you. Uh, Next up, we have Joan Marwa, who's a support staff person for Seven Hills. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day, all of you here who do, in fact, have a heart and are here tonight to do your part to restore the funding to the people who most deserve it. Often when friends and family are gathered together, we often hear these words, isn't it too bad that we have to wait for a funeral to be together? Isn't it too bad that tonight we have to be here to mourn the loss, not only of funding, but to mourn the loss of human dignity, of self-esteem, to mourn the loss of my fellow co-workers who have been laid off, to mourn the loss of those who will get to be laid off, to mourn the loss of the parents who are here who have struggled year after year, fighting the good fight to get what their children need, want, and deserve from a state that has now turned their back on them. I've come to the State, ha the state House several times in the past year with a hope-filled heart, hopefully to meet with the legislators, to help to reason with them, And now, I'm angered. I'm totally bewildered how they could do what they have done to the people that we support. How they have assured us that with these cuts, no supports would be lost. Nothing would affect anybody. Well, hello, welcome to the real world. Look around, look around at the faces of the advocates who are here tonight. We've brought eight, 10, 12 of them with us. Look at their faces. Look at the sorrow, the bewilderment. God help us, what have we done? What have we allowed to be done? No more. Do I hear you? No more. Restore. No more. Restore the funds now. Restore the funds now. Because if you don't, we will be back and you will have us to reckon with again and again and yet again. We are not going under. Not without a fight. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Joan. So that was, uh, you know, that was a, a clip from uh, from a couple of the speakers mm -hmm. at, at that event. Uh, I know that uh, people are really focused on on finding a way to fix the cuts. Uh, Representative, what what do you think about the prospects of your bill now that, that your bill and and uh, at least nine others have been introduced? Uh, are you getting any signals? What are you hearing from legislative leaders about you know whether or not there's going to be a fix for this problem? Well, I know Leader Fo um, Speaker Fox. Um, he he would love to restore, it, but again, he has to to um, do his job. Which, which is work with 
the other leadership people. And um, I know I know there's a lot of talk on the floor, a lot of people for it. I've heard very few people really against it. Um, I've heard people say that there's no money to be had. Twelve million just from the lottery the other day. Somebody just got real rich. There's twelve million coming into the state. You know, um, there's other ways to the supplemental budget. Uh, when I met with the finance, um, we met as a group, and we were told that the money is there for the clients, that they never lost that money, they still get the same amount of money. But the services the, the, are gone. I talked to a, a, a bus driver, I think he works with Seven Hills, and he just got laid off, you know, and, and, and he loves his job. I mean, he picks these people up, mm -hmm. he brings them to the doctors, he brings them to functions. He's out of the job now, you know, and um, I, think, I think the majority of people and the amount of bills that are up there are in favor of restoring. It's how to restore it, you know, so do we cut from this one to, to get back to this one? I say yes, this is our most vulnerable population you know we we have to take care of them you know if, if we don't you know you know it, it's it's sad you know and frustrating mm -hmm. and you know it, if we spend more money taking care of prisoners than we do taking care of our citizens who are developmentally disabled and, and you know we need to we need to we need the prisons don't you know i, I can't say we don't need the prisons but um we, we need it. We need this this population to be able to live a comfortable, well balanced life as much as they can. And the only way to do that is with dedicated workers and funding. You know that that's absolutely well said. We only have about uh, a minute or so left. Uh, let me ask you each uh, one one quick question, uh, Representative. I know. I know there was some concern with legislative leaders about administrative waste and in and, and the agencies. Would you support efforts to make sure if there is a restoration of the money that the money be directed towards services and the people who provide those services? Definitely. Yeah, it's a concept. Whatever, here. Will, whatever, whatever will help this, that system, the workers and the clients stay together. You know, and I would support, 100% I would support it. Terrific. Emmanuel, is there a sense of urgency on, on, on fixing this, or can we wait until the state adopts a budget sometime in June? We, we, can't, we can't wait, and that's, that's, that's the fundamental challenge of the campaign right now, is to get that money restored right away, or a big portion of it, to provide some relief, at least to the, you know, the delect direct labor rate that the state reimburses the agencies um, so that the layoffs stop, so the day program can continue to function, um, so programs stop being consolidated. And I don't feel the real urgency um, up at the state house, and we're going to continue to fight um, and make sure that we create that urgency. We're not going away on this issue. Okay. Well, thank you both very much for your time. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I think we could probably talk at length uh, further, but hopefully some good things will happen um, out of this General Assembly on this issue, and maybe we can all come back together and talk about how that actually happened. Uh, thank you both again very Great much. Thanks, Jim. Thanks thank a lot, you. Jim. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Labor Vision. My name is James Parisi with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals. Join us on some upcoming shows with the Legislative Focus where we're going to talk about some firefighter issues as well as talk about the revenue bill that Representative Bennett just mentioned. Thank you. I'm Joan Manoir. I've been a direct support staff at Seven Hills, Rhode Island for approximately 23 years. And we're here today joining forces. It's our UNAP <coughs> local. We're here because we are tired of the cuts that have been made to our fellow employees. The majority of them are working for $10 and under, and they've proposed to take 5% from us and only 3% from the management. And as we're saying out here today, we work for Seven Hills, it's getting to the point where we can't pay our bills. It's wonderful. We've gotten a tremendous, tremendous amount of support by people passing by, waving to us, giving us that, that high sign. And that, that's important. It keeps you going, especially on a cold day like today when we're 
kind of like in a restricted corner area here, and we're not able to move around too much. But to every now and then, when you get that smile, that hands up, that thumbs up, and that horn tooting, um, it just reassures you that we're not alone out here, that there is an understanding and compassionate community that is behind us. Um, and that's just wonderful. It's their individuals that we support. Um, people who, <coughs> who they love and they care about as much as we do. Thank you. Yes, we did walk off the job today. Uh, we are a not-for-profit not organization, so we did give them a 10-day notice so that they could be well prepared. We would never have walked off leaving anyone in harm's way. Um, we know that they are being well supported, well taken care of in the interim. The strike began at 8 o'clock this morning and will end at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. We are here. We have walked off the job. We're serious about what we're doing. We want, we want to make uh, an impact on our employer. We want him to know that we are serious and we're not going away. We're here to stay until he restores um, some of the cuts. He can't take much more from us. Now let's say a few words about Dr. Jordan. The mercy killing. The half a million dollar man. He takes for himself in one year, in one year, where's Michelle? More than Michelle Armstrong, 27 year employee, every year put together, she has earned less than Dr. Jordan has taken to himself in one year. Boom! Shame on him! Shame on him! Shame on him! Shame on him! person I would like to, you to hear from is the president of the United Nurses and Allied Professionals, Linda McDonald, and uh, she has a few things to say to you. Well, hello to our brothers and sisters at Seven Hills. Hello from the UNAP. Hello to our other Thank you. 
take a break and let them hear this. The faith has just begun. They too have seen the General Assembly cut $24 million out of the budget and eight months later, after the problem was identified, the legislative leader, leaders have done nothing, nothing for you. As Jack said, my union has worked with UNAF and SEIU and the machinists in coalition. And my message to the workers at Seven Hills is, you are not alone. I stand here as an AFT representative in a city that just gave pink slips to 600 teachers and no one at the state level stood up and said that was wrong. Workers at Seven Hills, you are not alone in your frustration. I just came from bankruptcy court where a receiver named Judge Flanders has earned over a million and a half dollars while they're asking workers to pay take pay cuts Workers at Seven Hills, you are not alone in your frustration either. The workers at Trudeau are facing benefit cuts and pay cuts as well. The clients have already seen service cuts. The General Assembly has to act. They should have acted yesterday, but if we stand together, we will make sure they act tomorrow. Good luck in your struggle. All right, thank you, Jim. I want to uh, recognize a couple other people. T today, uh, Representative J.L. Grady was here, and I want to say that, that he's very important to us. He came here to walk our picket line. He has put a bill to restore the cuts, and he was the only representative that we, uh, out of all the reps and senators we invited to come to see our work, he was the only one who came. So keep in mind, uh, Representative J.L. Grady, he's doing great work and he was the only one that came out here today. The next person I'm gonna introduce you is a very, very meek and mild-mannered person. You're gonna to have to listen very carefully to hear him. I wanna introduce you to Jimmy Riley from the United Food and Commercial Workers. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. I'm honored to be here with you. I want to read something from your company's website. The mission statement of Seven Hills Foundation and its affiliates is to promote and encourage the empowerment of people with significant challenges so that each may pursue their highest possible degree of personal well-being and independence. My brothers and sisters, without the skill, compassion, and experience of the direct care staff workers. This is not a mission statement. This is mission impossible. <laughs> on Rhode Island's most vulnerable population, Davy Jordan is outraged that, that staff workers are standing up for themselves as well as the developmentally disabled. Davy Jordan, you are the outrage. <laughs> I know he heard me. <laughs> the developmentally disabled, their families and their dedicated caregivers must be treated with dignity and respect or the goal of the Seven Hills Foundation mission statement cannot be delivered. Thank you. us in the coalition and uh, he, he represents the Blackstone uh, uh, art and I'll uh, be here a few words from uh, E-Man. Right, e yeah. I just want to recognize uh, two uh, longtime workers of the Blackstone Valley Art, which 1199 SEIU represents Michael Thompson and Joanne Sarge. Yeah. We have been 
fighting together with you guys for eight long months. And there's a motto at 1199. We do whatever it takes, as long as it takes, and we're going to continue to fight together. Now, the folks that passed the $24 million cut, they did it without a hearing, without hearing from you, the consumers, and the family members. But they're hearing you today, and the state is hearing you. You are the conscience of the state. We need to change things in the state, and I know the direct care staff at here, at Seven Hills, and at Blackstone Valley Arc, you don't work to make Davy rich. You do it to raise the dignity and to give meaning to the lives of the consumers you love every day. You are the heart of the agency, and they need to treat you with dignity and respect, and we're going to keep fighting until we get justice for everyone. Thank you. living in an immoral state because we had legislative leaders who in the middle of the night, without even having the courage to hold a public hearing, to listen to you and the families, cut $24 million. And what does that mean? For them, it's we balance the budget. $24 million. For you, it's a pay cut. For you, it's a reduction in your benefits in your standard of living. By those standards, we have an immoral General Assembly and an immoral government, and it's you, the people who work in these programs, the brothers and sisters from the labor movement, who are gonna right, get this state back on the right track because we're gonna make people make a choice. There's an old saying in the labor movement, which side are you on? And right now, these people are going to have to make a decision. Are you on the side of the people who take care of those who are developmentally disabled? Are you on so the side of people and their families like that? Or are you on the side of the rich who we gave all these tax credits to so they could create jobs? And unless I'm missing something, they didn't. They took the money, put it in their pocket, and left you out in the cold. So we got to turn this around and just put it in the labor movement that does this. And it starts today in Woonsocket on this corner. And we're going to keep saying to them, the only way for you to stop being immoral is to restore that money so that people who do this terrific work, this very important work, are treated with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. Let's keep fighting. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen three times each week, Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., and Saturdays at 5 p.m. <laughs>